Hello and welcome to another episode of Leaders of Transformation. Today we are going to talk about what the future might look like as an alternative to the political situation that we're in right now. And we've got a wonderful guest here to talk about that, Simon Chadwick. He grew up in South Africa as the son of a prominent anti-apartheid activist. Uh, he learned firsthand uh, experienced it firsthand what it was like to live in a totalitarian society. Then he came to the U.S. and uh, has been very successful in business and leading teams and so forth and he'll talk about that. And so he just has a really interesting perspective on this and he actually wrote a book called For the People, A Citizen's Manifesto to Shaping Our Nation, Nation's Future. So Simon, welcome to Lutus Transformation. We're excited that you're here today. Thank you very much, and I'm excited to be here. Thank you for asking me. My pleasure. And Alicia Parker-Smith from Greenleaf Books, thank you to you for um, making the introduction. I always like to thank those that make introductions to great guests because it supports this show with great content. And so thank you to her and to Greenleaf Books for doing that and introducing me to Simon. And also I want to thank you as the listeners and the viewers, because you're the reason why we do this podcast and we appreciate you. We appreciate your support. If you like this episode, please share it with a friend, leave us a rating and review. It does make a huge impact in terms of our ability to reach more people with this message. And we're in, I think it's 144 countries now, and we just want to continue to get that reach out there to get this message to more people. The message of, um, of hope and a possibility that everyone can be a leader of transformation and we are in this together. So with that in mind, Simon, just kind of give us an idea what it was like to grow up in South Africa. You're a white man. You have a father who is uh, fighting against apartheid. What was that like? It was surreal and at times very scary. Um, surreal in as much as if you're in a society where uh, the races are kept apart by law and by apart I mean really apart you know blacks could not live in white areas or vice versa blacks needed passes to come into cities you actually had to have a document that said you had a reason to be there um, so that was very surreal, but the scary part, my father was Bishop of Kimberley and Kurman, which is the northwest quarter of South Africa. And as you say, he was a very prominent anti apartheid activist. So um, the secret police were very, very active. Um, our house was bugged, our phones were bugged, our car was bugged. Um, the, the police had a 24-7 car outside the gate um, in a wonderfully British way of showing polite defiance. My mother used to take them a cup of tea every morning. Um, so there was surreal again, but it was scary. And, you know, the, my dad actually was finally arrested by the secret police and interrogated and indeed one of his priests died under interrogation by falling out of a seven-story window um which you know falling um so you know it it was um you you came to realize just how power misapplied is not only immoral but dangerous and you know we were fighting very very hard to overcome this and um God bless Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu and all of those who actually managed to bring it about. But yeah, so, and from there, I actually spent a year in teaching in Kenya when Jomo Kenyatta was president and that was a dictatorship too. And uh, people used to just disappear. Um, and, you know, people that you knew disappeared. So, um, you know, this is really, I think framed very much the way in which I view society and life and um, it really prompted me to look at the way in which we're going here in the United States and to write the book. Yeah. 
Well, I don't think we have any concept. I mean, we can watch movies. I watched a movie actually on the weekend that was called Skin. And mm. it was a, you may have heard of it. Yeah, it's the, the, the white couple in South Africa that have this child that is theirs that she didn't fool around or anything. It's, it's you know, just somehow they had blood, you know, somewhere in the mm. history, right? So they have this child that is black and they're trying to get her to be documented as white so that she can have the privileges of white. But then she doesn't even feel like she doesn't even know what her identity and understand. She doesn't feel comfortable in that space either. And so she's torn between these two worlds. And I mean, you hear and you see through some of these depictions of what it's like, but we have no concept of that here. And we don't want to have a concept of that here, quite frankly, but, um, yeah, you, so you came to the U.S. and you started to get into business and so forth. So kind of bring us up to speed with some of your experience in that respect, because I think that also does shape your ability to um, to think through and see how everything fits together in economically, politically, and so forth. Yeah, so um, there was a fairly big interim between South Africa and the U.S., I um, completed my education. I got a master's at Oxford in politics and economics and philosophy. Um, and then went into, I went, became a, a trainee with a company in London. Uh, and then uh, worked in the UK, worked in Italy. Um, so I had a, quite a, a mixture of experiences, if you like. Um, and my company uh, said, you know, we need you to go to New York. Um, they'd made an acquisition which was going wrong and and they asked me to turn it around. That was supposed to last three years and I'm still here 30 years later, um, having married a Louisiana and, um, and brought up a family here. Um, so initially, you know, when you come to this country, there's it, the first misconception is, you know, the Brits and the Americans are the same. They're not. This is a foreign country for Brits, just as... UK is for Americans. Um, and so you are looking at things slightly differently and also obviously with a more, perhaps very often a more multicultural experience than many people have here. Certainly that wasn't the case in New York, but certainly in other parts of the country. Um, so I ran a few companies here. Um, you know, my, basically what I was about was turning companies around and growing them. Um, and then in 2004, I founded my own company of management consultants, uh, which I've run ever since. Uh, I've lived in New York, I've lived in Arizona, and now North Carolina. Um, both of them, all of them very, very, very different. And I think that's one of the things that one realizes coming to this country that, you know, the, it's not really a melting pot. It's more a potpourri. Um, there's, and people do tend to identify themselves, I think, by three different things. First of all, their hyphenated ethnicity. You know, am I Italian American, Amer African American, whatever? Then by the state that they come from, and then finally by being American. And that was, that's quite an interesting thing in, in and of itself, because if you come from Europe or any other uh, similar country, there's a, a very, very strong sense of homogenous identity. That's not the case here. Um, Arizona was amazing because uh, I really got to look at corrupt, ineffective governments close up for the first time. Uh, when we lived there, I think, before um, uh, before a Democrat came in uh, who was really good, I think the previous five governors had either been impeached and or jailed. Uh, so, you know, this was a very- Great track odd, record. Great track record. <laughs> and we had Sheriff Arpaio uh, in Maricopa County who was racially profiling Hispanics and you know running uh tent jails out in the desert and all sorts of crazy 
crazy stuff. Yeah, and I actually just want to caveat because earlier I said about we don't know what it's like in this country. Um, for the most part, we don't know what it's like in this generation, like what you experience there, but certainly we have a history of some pretty uh, oppressive uh, situations and so forth. And some of that has uh, continued to linger, which is what you're talking about here. Yeah, I think that's very, very true. Um, I've traveled quite extensively in the, in the deep south. Um, and I remember my first visit down to Southern Arkansas and rural Mississippi. And it was very, very similar to South Africa in the 1980s very similar and you had this very dis, you know very distinct social strata defined by skin color uh, the poverty that i saw down there in the rural areas i had not seen since africa um so that struck me very very singularly uh, because you know yes we've got this history of slavery and also, you know, uh, genocide against the ethnic Americans, the, the, the original Americans. But we do sort of, until things like George Floyd happen, we tend to hide them all behind the curtain. We, or we get upset about it and then we forget about it. Because yeah, it yeah. yeah. And I, I think one of the things that's really occurred in the last six months is that this pandemic crisis combined with George Floyd and others has ripped that curtain aside and all the ugly truths uh, as well as as well as some really beautiful truths like neighborliness and people helping each other out and helping the elderly and so on but all the uglier truths are now there to be seen in, in full daylight and it was those truths that I was able perhaps as a as somebody who was not natural born American I was able to see more easily because of my my past yeah I saw something that somebody posted um it was yesterday and um and he talked about the the fact is that most of us are actually neighborly mm -hmm. most of us are kind and we judge people on the content of their character as opposed to the color of their skin or, mm. or there's a lot of people like that. Um, and yet there's this ugly side. Mm. And, um, and so, I, but I know you, I know you go beyond like there's, there's some things that you said you saw and you just alluded to it there that when you came to the U S and you said you saw some parallels, yeah. um, based on your book, there was a lot more to it than just what we're talking about here. So can you go a little deeper into what you noticed? And yes. there are some people like, you know, if this is your experience, this is your point of view that you're experiencing based on what you, how have you grown up coming here? The, the view in which you see the world, like you said, it, it, it yeah. does color that. So, yes. I mean, I, I think um, the, it, it particularly in the last few years, um, I've first of all seen a swing towards authoritarianism. And we've seen that very, very plainly in the last few weeks. Um, you know, federal uh, troops, to put it, they're not really troops, but federal agents in cities with out badges on their uniforms, shoving people into vans, taking them who knows where. That is the behavior of an authoritarian society. Uh, we're seeing um, politicians acting even more corruptly, I think, than you know, they, they have perhaps in the past. Maybe, you know, I, there have been periods definitely in American history where corruption has been rampant and, and authoritarianism has been rampant as well. Um, so all of that made, started to make me feel very, very uneasy. And um, if you talk to Holocaust survivors in this country, they will also tell you they're incredibly uneasy right now. Incredibly uneasy. Because it's resonant of what they saw in the 1930s. 
So I decided um, on a couple of things once this really crystallized. One, I was going to take citizenship. And two, I was going to start writing the book, researching it and then writing it. And the more I was researching it, the more I, I was able to distinguish what was so different about this country in many ways, which is the, the we, we have a tendency to believe that we're really exceptional. And in many, many ways we are, no doubt about it. But in many ways we're exceptional in the wrong way. So if you look at healthcare, or you look at education, or um, social security, it's always the minorities who are primarily disadvantaged. It's not to say that they're not poor whites or you know ill-educated whites or whites who don't can't go to good schools. There are, but the it far more likely, far more uh, likely to be Hispanic or black or whatever. And so you start looking at that and you start looking at some of the statistics in this country, you know, the net worth of a, an average white family is about $93,000. Pre-pandemic, the net worth of the average African-American family was less than $4,000. It's stunning. Wow. Over half African-American families are living with net negative worth. Um, so you realize that essentially there's this undercurrent and it's not just about race, but it's also about, it's, a, it's about a different construct of society. And I think, I think much of it actually goes back to the Reagan era. Um, you know, if you think about mental health, that was the era in which the mental health system was effectively closed down. And when responsibility was transferred to the streets and then to the jails. Uh, that was the era in which Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan were, you know, in lockstep and she famously declared, there is no such thing as society. Uh, which I think, you know, has become a mantra um, on the right in many in many places and it's a the 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 concept of what society should be or could be is now uh, very divergent dependent on your political points of view the other thing that i think one really really sees in this country um, coming from abroad is the indecent role that money plays in politics and how corrupting it is and the the huge amounts of what's called dark money these days since citizens are united that is at play in this in the system and so the system has now become one which is rewarding uh the wealthy the very 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 wealthy and politicians and politicians to basically preserve that there's a great book called the dictator's handbook which lays out the theory of how people become dictators and essentially what it says is look there's a nominal electorate that's everybody who can vote there's the actual selectorate that's all the people who actually do vote whether they their vote counts or not is a different matter and whether they can vote is a different matter and then there's the winning coalition that puts somebody in power and usually that coalition is relatively small the smaller that coalition the more likely you're going to move towards dictatorship because all politicians have to pay off those who elected them. If you've got a wide coalition in a democracy, you pay with public goods. If it's small, you pay with money. And in this country, it's become smaller and smaller and smaller. And that I think is one of the biggest things that worries me. And it's one of the biggest things I noticed. I appreciate that. Thank you um, for unpacking that a little bit for us. Give us uh, some insight into that. Those of us that are not, I know like you, you have a 
masters in, in politics and so forth. Um, so I appreciate your point of view when you, when you, uh, you share. I look at it like there's these two parties and both are not effective. Like but when you talk about corruption, I see it on both sides. And so when we talked in the beginning about prefacing what the future could look like beyond where we're at right now, I think it's not a matter of when we're voting this year is like, oh, this one's going to be perfect. It's going to solve mm. all the problems. And this one is the one that's corrupt. I don't think that's what we've got going on here. We've got a corrupt system mm. that needs to be overhauled from the ground up. And, I do. Yeah. Agree. yeah. yeah. I think the first thing that we have to do, and this is really difficult for politicians to do, it's going to take a movement, basically, is to get money out of the equation. Um, there are many other systems in the world in which, through which money has been kept out. Um, so in some countries, you know, the, 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 the state funds elections entirely, and every, you know, all candidates get equal amounts. In other countries, you can raise as much as you want, but you can't spend it. You can only spend a certain amount on electioneering. And in other countries, you can only raise so much, but you, you know, whatever you raise, you can spend. Whatever system we want to choose, we have to get the money out. Because only then will we be able to look at the, the will we be able to return to the constitution, actually, where the legislature and the executive and the judiciary are indeed equal and where the, you know, all politicians actually are having to pay for their continued tenure in power in public goods. And part of that, uh, one, of, one of the things I did in the book was to look at society through the lens of Maslow's hierarchy. And which, as you, you know, starts off at the very basic needs, physical needs, roof over your head, food, all of that moving up through belonging and, and to self-actualization. What a government is there to do, I believe, under a social contract is to create a framework of security in which people can live and obtain the, need, the needs that they have and belong and achieve the best that they can be. The government's not there to make them do that or to direct them. It's there to set up the framework of security. And security, security comes from the word securitas in Latin. And securitas in Latin meant freedom from fear. And I think what we have here, which is really pulling us back, is um, an undercurrent of fear. And I'm not talking about um, fear of, you know, Nazi people in government or, or anything like that. I'm talking about fear of losing a job, fear of contracting an illness and not being able to pay medical fees, losing your home. Uh, if you're black, uh, fear of going down the street. Um, these are, are fears that need to be eradicated if society is going to be able to grow and to, to flourish. And in order for those to be, those, that framework to be provided, the, 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 the public servants that we have have to basically understand that their job is to provide that framework. It is a social contract. You provide these things for, for us and we'll pay our taxes and obey reasonable laws. That's the contract. Yeah, it's like you're, think, they're, they're supposed to be stewards of that so that it gets right. distributed and taken care of. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, very much yeah. so. Yeah. And the problem is, is like when you talk about taking money out of that system, the very people that would legislate that are the ones that right now are benefiting from it. So, mm -hmm. you know, why would they? Why would they want to, right? So at this point, yeah. it's like if the most the person with the most money, the most clout, the most, you know, arrangements behind the scenes that are going on agreements, those are the ones that, that uh, are the most successful, unfortunately. And so yes. how do you, how do you, so I, I, it comes back to this conversation I had a couple weeks ago with um, somebody, David uh, Schwerin, 
who wrote a book called Conscious Globalism and um, Know Your Soul and so forth. And so what he, he was talking a little bit, we were talking a little bit this as well, is this idea of self-interest. Mm. And so it's actually in our best interests to do what's best for everyone, but that's not actually how people define self-interest, the best right. self-interest. They define it as what's best for me and mine. Yes. Yes. And it's an interesting, um, an interesting comparison because if you go to, for example, any of the Nordic countries, um, self-interest is very heavily defined as the interests of everybody, the interests of society. Um, and one of the fascinating things is that actually those countries are not only some of the richest countries in the world, but also the happiest. Um, which kind of tells you a little bit. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. How are you going to get those in power to actually, how are you going to get turkeys to vote for Christmas? I mean, basically that's, that's what we're asking to do. And I, I said earlier, I think it has to be a movement. I am actually really impressed by and hopeful for Gen Z. Um, you know, what we've seen out of Gen Z in the last year, 18 months has been really very um, inspiring. Uh, so I'm very hopeful that they actually will, they do have a different set of values, um, very much so. We're, you know, I'm, I've worked in the research industry and I'm constantly looking at data and of these sorts of things. Their value set is much more societal. Um, so that's one good thing. And I, you know, I'm going to sound like, uh, evangelical Christians now. We need the Supreme Court to change, <laughs> but not in the way that they want it to. Um, sorry, that's, uh, yeah, probably inappropriate, but we, we do need, uh, we do need judi a judiciary that basically says, no, this is not. This is not how the constitution was meant to work. And we're going to, to push it. To, to your point, I think everybody is, um, deserves opinion. And it doesn't mean, and I think that's one of the, the challenges that we have right now is that people are in their camps, right? So yes. they say, this is the way it is. And I'm going to fight for this. And I'm not going to listen to the other side, to what they mm. have to say, to even consider it. And so you almost have to be afraid of what do you say that might offend somebody because this is a very mm. offensive or offensible society right now where everybody's mm. offended by everything. And so one of the things that I learned over the years is that I can hold a thought in somebody, there's a great quote about this, about the ability to, I think it was Socrates said this, about the ability to hold a thought without like you can entertain it without actually taking it on. And I think that would be a skill that would help us all to be able to say, you know what, this person might think differently, but Abraham Lincoln was, was known. There was a, somebody who was one of his generals. He didn't like, and he said, I don't like this person. I need to get to know them better. Yes. Yeah. One of his more famous quotes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think th there is that need and, and that also, comes through um, a better a better education system, teaching people how to think, not just how to learn by rote. Um, teaching people that you know they're just because somebody thinks differently to you, they're not a moron. Um, there's also, I think, the need to understand um, that people have their own narratives. Uh, it's it's quite interesting. This, the, there's a, a discipline today that is gaining ground called narrative economics. Basically, what it says is you can take two families in the same place who are demographically identical. You know, they're, they're say, uh, white, two kids, you know, living in a house in a city that perhaps has lost its factory or something like that. And you would expect their views to be very similar but they're, they're not, they're divergent. Why? Because each of them has different narratives and those narratives 
are what people are saying around them. It's the social media bubble that they may be in. It may be the church that they go to or experience in you know different ways, with their parents or whatever. And you've got to get to understand people's narratives to be able to get through this kind of, no, I'm not going to talk to you uh, attitude or, or behavior. And I don't think we have really mastered that yet. We don't really get behind what is what is causing what sometimes people feel is almost cult-like behavior, you know. Yes. Against all the known facts, I'm still going to believe this. Yes. So. Yeah, there's a, there's a great book called Influence by Robert Cialdini, and he talks about in there how one example is how people think and how they, how you can influence how people think. And if you, if you have somebody and you get them to make a decision, one decision that will support the next decision, the next decision, the next decision. So they talk about the, I think it was the cancer society that was going around and looking for donations and everybody was saying, no, 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 no. So what they did is they changed their strategy and they went there and said, do you mind if we put a sign on your, lawn for the next couple of weeks supporting the, the, the cancer society or whatever right people said yeah sure no big deal put a sign on my lawn i don't care they come back after two weeks thank you so much for allowing us to put the sign on your lawn would you would you consider making a donation to the society and the response was substantially different than mm. what it was originally. Why? Because the first decision they had made was the sign. Mm. And now they were just supporting that decision. Yeah. And, yeah. and so uh, I think there's a lot of camping out. And, and one of the things that as I said along the way, somewhere I learned, you know, maybe from my parents, but, um, but just even some of the training and, and so forth that I've done, is to seek to understand why is somebody actually mm. responding that way? Why are they upset? I, I teach desk and personalities. So it's all about seeking to understand the different ways that people behave and communicate and so forth. Why do they say that? Why are they so upset about this? What are they triggered? I mean, I'm a coach too, right? It's like, what, why are they being so triggered by that? And I think if we could, to your point about the education system, because I, I think about where does this shift have to happen? It's not going to, it's not going to happen by saying to Washington, Hey, you know, you got to get the money out. You, yeah, right. You know, we don't exactly. start there. Where do we start? And what you said about this, the education is teaching people how to seek to understand and listen to each other to understand why somebody would even think that way. Yeah. Understand their narrative, as you said. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting because every time you look at one element of the equation, and you peel a layer away, there's something else that needs to, to change underneath that. And education is, is a prime, prime example. Um, you know, in this country, we funded education in the same way we used to fund it when there were little schoolhouses on the prairie. You know, it was a local community thing. The local community paid for the school and through property tax. That has ex exists to this day, which means if you're in a nice, rich area, great schools. If you're in a poor area, tough luck. Um, and as we've, you know, as we've struggled with education politically over the years, none of us have really looked at that part of it. But also, the more we go into standardized testing and all of that sort of stuff, the less we actually teach the whole child and particularly in empathetic thinking. Um, the school I went to, uh, which was in the UK, um, they measured their success, not by standardized tests, although they're very proud of their test results, but by what their alumni accomplish over the, over the years. What did we, you know, what did we help put out into the world that helped the world? That's how they, they, they actually think about it. So they look at the fruits and they see yes. how good are the roots based on yeah. what the fruits are. Exactly. And I think if we could adopt some uh, similar It would be scary if we looked thought, at that right now. It would. 
Yeah. Yes, we've got more people in jail than anybody else. Um, no, but it's it's um, it's a it's a mind shift, and to in order to get that mind shift, you have to basically re-evaluate what education is all about, um, and we have to also be honest with ourselves. I mean, we've got I think a pretty good elementary education system we've got a pretty good university education system but our k our, our our secondary system sucks it really is abominable and when you look at where we fall in the world in terms of our educational ability you know, we're the richest country in the world and we in math we're 23rd in science we're 24th and this is in a world in which we're going to have to compete um, we, we've got to take a look at education and we have to look at it holistically. And only then can that sort of thinking begin to permeate. Mm. So, as I say, there, there are layers upon layers. And that's, to a certain extent, what I've tried to do in, in the book is to unwrap those layers. Yeah. Yeah, well, when you talk about education, then you look at if children are going to school and they're hungry, then how mm -hmm. well are they being educated? So then it comes down to that, right? Yep. How are they being, you know, the, the poverty level like you were talking about earlier, are they being fed? A, a hungry child is not going to learn as well as the child that has got a full belly. So yeah, it's this systemic um, layer by layer, like you said. And so it's not something that we're going to fix overnight. It's not something that's going to be fixed by an election. However, the reason why I wanted to have you share, and, I'm, and I would love for, for people to get a copy of your book, For the People, A Citizen's Manifesto to Shaping Our Nation's, Nation's Future. And we'll make sure there's a link in the show notes to that. Um, but you can also go to simonchadwick.us is Simon's website. And again, that'll all be available there so you can get it on Leaders, leaders of Transformation. Um, but yeah, to... to start drilling into this. What will it take to actually have the shift happen? There's a lot of people that are saying, this is what we should do, we should do this, we should do this. But at some point, like you said, it has to be a movement. It has to be where it gets to be, where we decide that hey, we're actually gonna do something about this. And what you said about Gen Z, I think is, is right. They, they don't care, like they're, they have a different set of values. They also don't care what anybody else thinks like they they are very adamant and strong some of them mm -hmm. very strong some of them have no idea what's going on and they don't right that's one thing but there's a there's a huge percentage of that population who do care and who are very strong in their opinions about what it is in a good way in saying look we need to do something about this from a society standpoint so it's exciting so we're in exciting times it might get a little, I, I have a feeling it's going to get a little messy in between Mm, I think yes, we potentially can uh, can build a very uh, much brighter future going forward. And uh, I appreciate you sharing. I appreciate the work that you're doing, getting that message out there, and giving it a context for people where it's not about us and them, but that it's it's really about how do we come together and figure this out together. And, and how do we friends. how do we start a conversation? How do we start the conversation? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, Simon, thank you so much. I appreciate you. And, uh, Thank you, Nicole. This, this has been really fun and a lovely occasion. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Likewise. And thank you to our listeners for tuning in. I hope that this has been enlightening and maybe just starting to open up that conversation. Maybe you want to start having, maybe in your own local area, start having conversations with people that don't think the same way as you do. And before you put the hand up and say, I don't want to hear what you have to say, just say, why do you, why do you think that? What is your, what's behind it? Seek to understand. One of the things I, I talk about in my workshops when I teach personalities is rather than frustration, choose fascination. Rather than mm. criticism, choose curiosity. And if we were to do that, we could start to see how other, why people do the things they do, why they think the way they think. And we'd have a lot, and that's the empathetic learning is, is to, is to understand each other better. And as we understand each other better, 
I know that we're, we're going to learn a whole lot that will help us to move forward. We'll also enjoy the journey a whole lot more as well. So I encourage you that leaders of transformation take action. So give that a go, right? In your own look, you don't have to wait for Washington to mandate it, okay? You don't have to wait for somebody to tell you, just do it. You don't need permission from anyone. Go walk across, all you gotta do to find somebody who thinks differently is walk across the street in your neighborhood and I'm sure there's somebody that thinks differently and start to have that conversation with them. Safe conversation with them and hopefully it's somebody that is willing to share with you and be open and so forth. And uh, so love to hear how that goes and uh, we'll continue to get this message out so uh, that we can make this world a better place. That's not just a cliche, we really do want to do that. So. With that in mind, if you like this episode, please share it with a friend. Uh, we appreciate you also giving us a rating or review as I talked about earlier. And uh, we've got about 350 episodes up on leadersoftransformation.com. Amazing people that are making a difference in the world. If you wanna change from the negative news, uh, come on over to our website and there's lots of positive things happening in the world. People that are making a great difference that can encourage you and inspire you during this time. So. With that, thank you again. We look forward to seeing you in the next episode of Leaders of Transformation real soon.